everybody. Um, we're back with the HDO Breaking Down Barriers series. Um, I am joined with Ashley Clark, one of our representatives from the community, a big um, Instagram uh, influencer from in the HD community and communicator um, to help us translate some of the difficult concepts and remove some of those barriers to understanding HD research. Uh, today, we're joined by Peter McColgan from Roche, who is going to talk a bit more about the, their programme in Huntington's disease um, and give us a little bit of an update. Um, so hello, Peter. Um, if you want to um, maybe reintroduce yourself. Um, Hi, hi, Lauren. Um, thanks so much for having me. So my name is Peter McCulligan. I'm the um, clinical science leader on the Tom and Erson program at Roche. Um, I'm a neurologist um, and I've been working in Huntington's disease for more than 10 years. I, I still see patients in clinic regularly. But my, my role at Roche is really to um, lead the, the clinical science team on the Tom and Erson program. Thanks so much. Um, Ashley, do you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> so as Lauren said, my name is Ashley and I am from Northern Ireland and have been involved with the HD community for many years. And it is just a coincidence that we're all Northern Irish. So we're going to try very hard to slow down our speech and enunciate so that our background team have a much easier job of translating <laughs> anything that is is slightly harder to understand um so let's get into it so um before we get into kind of the, the rush program um program how did you get involved in research peter with with hd i know you mentioned that you've been working used to work with patients and that um so I I first met HD patients when I was working in Cambridge University as a as a junior doctor um, out of medical school and then and then after that I uh, moved to University College London to work with Sarah Tabrizi who I'm sure many of you may know um, as as one of the the key leaders in Huntington's disease. And um, I, I mean, I, I, I still work with Sarah and, and still do some work at University College London. Um, but so I've, I've been there for I think it's more than twelve years now. Um, well, once I started working on HD, I, I fell in love with the community, and um, I think a lot of people say once you work in HD, you get hooked and you, you don't want to leave. So, yeah, well, we're a bit biased, but. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's move into reminding us about the Roche program. What is Tom and Erson, and what is it? What is it? What are you planning to do with it? So Tom and Erson is what's called a anti stents gluonucleotide. It, it's a drug that we deliver via spinal tap or a, a lumbar puncture, um, and we do that so that we can get it to the areas of the brain that are most affected in HD. Um, it works by lowering both the bad mutant Huntington protein and also the normal Huntington protein. Um, and we've been able to show conclusively across a number of studies that we can lower the, the mutant Huntington protein in the cerebral spinal fluid. That's the fluid that surrounds the, the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so we had a large study called Generation HD1 and I'm sure many in the community know that um, that didn't reach its objective. Um, really what we saw is that the more frequent dose, um, the dose was too high. And so we're now moving from, from a what's called a phase three study, so a really large study to a phase two study, which is a, a smaller study. And the phase two study, we're looking at a lower dose and we're looking at a less frequent dose than than the the one that um the one that we looked at in the previous study. So we maybe we before have, we yeah. get into the the second new study, it might be helpful to kind of remind us about um so we last time we spoke was in September last year, mm -hmm. and you give us a bit of information on what was called a post hoc analysis from the original generation HD1. So it, I think it'd be very helpful to explain what a post hoc analysis mm -hmm. is and maybe some of the top kind of summary headlines of that. Of course. So 
when when generation hd1 start we looked at the data in detail and we really wanted to understand is there a group of patients on the study that might have had benefit from tom and Erson? And when we did this, we found that individuals who were younger with less advanced disease had potential benefit. But it's what's called a post hoc analysis. So it means that the original study wasn't designed to test benefit in this specific subgroup of individuals. Therefore, to make sure that what we saw wasn't the chance finding, we need to design the study specifically to look at potential benefit in this subgroup. And that's really what the new study generation HD2 is doing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Lauren. So you're what have I got this right? You had your, you know, your first trial, which was the generation HD one, and it didn't work for one reason and another. You just went back and you've done what you're calling the post hoc, which is like you took a massive deep dive into what you did find, and you've sort of went, oh we didn't mean to find this, but we have, let's now custom build another study, which you're going to go on to tell us about, which is the Generation HD2. Exactly. And you're looking into what you found to make sure that it wasn't like a whoopsie find. It was a legitimate, we can back this up and then we'll move. Would that then mean moving, you're saying Generation HD2 is a phase two, would that two move seven. into a phase three if you were fit to Exactly. So, so with the two lower doses that we're looking at, if we can, if we're confident that we have a dose where people benefit from based on the phase two study, then we'd like to move into a larger phase three study. And I think it's important to say that really the first step for us is to replicate this finding in the subgroup, that's the individuals who are younger with less advanced disease. But ideally, if we can do that, we would like to then expand out. Our ultimate goal is to try and treat as many people as possible, especially if we we're, we're confident that we can see benefit from the drug. Was there the same, you know, like safety concerns or that with Generation HD two, um, or how did you switch that up from HD one? It's a great question. So. So Generation HD1 had two different, what we call dosing regimens. So we had two groups of people, both taking 120 milligrams, but one group was taking it every eight weeks and the other group was taking it every 16 weeks. Now in people taking it every eight weeks, we saw that uh, there was more side effects than say people taking, um, taking a dummy drug or a placebo drug. Um, but in those taking it every 16 weeks, the, the amount of side effects was the same as in those people that weren't getting the drug. So we're really focusing on the less frequent dose going forward because we anticipate that the safety profile will be similar to those taking placebo or those taking the dummy drug. Do you think that might have been, like, whenever you first introduced it, you said that you were lowering the Huntington protein, both the good and the bad. Do you yeah. think that was maybe because you were lowering the good Huntington protein and we were just losing too much of that Huntington protein as a whole, whether it be good or bad? It's It's a really great question. I think that the challenge with this is that we can't disentangle whether for that more frequent dosing group, whether it was because the dose of the drug was too high and just, at, you know, like, I always think of things like paracetamol or Tylenol. Um, so it's great at helping with headache, but if you take it too much or if you take it too frequently, it can cause side effects. And I think we can think about Tom and Erson maybe in the same way. So if the dose is too high or it's too frequent, then maybe you get side effects. But if we dial down the dose and dial down the frequency, we avoid the side effects, but hopefully we see the, the benefit. And I think that this is really the direction we're going. Do you think there's any other important data pieces from the original trial that might be helped to understand that a bit more? Of like why? Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. So uh, as time has gone on, we've because we had so much data, it took us so long to analyze it. And I mean, even up until recently, we were still getting more data in. And um, recently what we've seen is that neurofilament light, which is a measure of, um, 
it, it's a measure of, of brain cell dysfunction or brain cell death. So neurofilament light, um, when we measure it in the blood at the less frequent dose in generation HD1 actually begins to go down. And that, that's probably a good thing. What we saw at the higher frequent dose when we measure neurofilament light is that it went up. But if we see, we're seeing it go down in the less frequent dose, so that points to potential benefit. And of course, this is, gives us confidence going forward with generation HD2. I think the other thing to say with some of the new data that we've seen and, and we've been able to share recently at, at HSG, um, we did a lot of digital tests. So we were able to measure um, movement and, and motor function. And we, we created a measure that is really sensitive to motor function. And when we looked at that and controlled for the fact that not all people completed the digital assessments, we actually see potential benefit again in that treatment every 16 week group. Taking this all together, it really gives us confidence going forward in generation HD2 that um, we may see NFL go down, which is a good thing. We may see benefit on the clinical measures and, and this is really what we're hoping for. I guess we can add a bit further, um, uh, just for people to understand at home is the importance of these measures and, and kind of how they are important for clinical trials and assessing whether drugs work in, um, there's something that we call biomarkers. So, um, things that we can measure and they're quantifiable. So things that are much more accurate and sensitive than potentially the clinical assessments. And when I say clinical, there might be the rating scales or the tests, the questionnaires that a doctor would do when you or a physician when you come and see them, they might make you walk in a straight line or or tap your fingers. Um, so hopefully when we have things like digital assessments and blood tests like neurofilament light, um, they might be more sensitive, which would be a benefit because they might detect or it might be easier to detect changes in them quicker, quick, more quickly. Um, and that might, you know, tell us if a drug's working quicker. If, you know, there's a lot of work and research that needs to, do, to be done, but this is kind of why these companies like Roche are, are testing these biomarkers. And we're going to actually do a, a specific session with them, Professor Sarah Tabrizzi on biomarkers coming up um, as well. I'm sure though, you'll see that soon. Um, so let's go into the new trial. So um, you mentioned a bit already about the kind of this idea about younger and lower CAP score um, was a finding that you find in the post hoc analysis. Can you just go a bit deeper into that and try and, and kind of explain that a bit more of those attributes? So at the post hoc analysis, we find that individuals aged 25 to 50 um, with a CAP score between 400 and 500. We found that these individuals treatment every 16 weeks at 120 milligrams had benefit. We were also able to um, take the individuals in that group and look at the level of tominers in, in, the, in the brain fluid via the lumbar puncture. And we saw that if the levels were slightly lower then they, they had even more benefit. Um, so this is really how we've designed the new study. So the part of the inclusion criteria is that age 25 to 50 and the CAP score 400 to 500. And then the lower doses is because the lower levels of Tom and Erson in, in the previous study seem to work better. Um, so can we, there, Peter? yeah. <laughs> um, so just for anybody that is you know this is maybe the first style video like this that they've watched or they're new to hd research and that give me like a really top line overview of what a person's cap score would be because i could count the baseball caps in the spare room but i'm pretty sure that's not what you're talking about so, so a CAP score is calculated based on someone's age and someone's CAG repeat length. Um, so the CAG repeat length is is a, a measure you typically get when you, when you get your gene test. Um, there are different ways to calculate the CAP score. So I think if you know if you want to find out what your CAP score is, or if you're eligible for this, you know potentially eligible for this study, the easiest thing to do is speak to your HD neurologist or physician. 
and they 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 can guide you through the inclusion and the exclusion criteria and give you a good idea of whether you might you know might be someone that, that can participate in the study I think it's also important to kind of reiterate there that kind of to go through any of the you always have to go through um your permission yeah. to take part in these studies that's why you know keeping engaged with um a site that that had um that may be participating getting involved in enroll hd um will help you you know be linked in with clinicians that may be involved in the trial and might be able to help you learn things like the eligibility eligibility criteria and if you fit it um i think it's it's quite I think hard for sometimes communities to get their head around why some inclusion criteria are there and why they're important. Um, so maybe a bit more on that, you know, I think you've highlighted a bit about this trial specifically is trying to replicate that finding that you found in the post hoc. Um, but there's always some other, sometimes some other criteria that people find hard to understand. Could you maybe? explain a bit more about why inclusion criteria is so important for trials in general? Of course. Um, so inclusion criteria is really important because we need to be able to um, we need to be able to make sure that there aren't things that may make the results difficult to interpret. So maybe there's an underlying medical condition that may so to give an example we do lumbar punctures to to measure mutant huntington in the spinal fluid but also to deliver the drug now if people have problems with bleeding for example um then lumbar punctures can be difficult and so um we we make sure that people don't have any underlying problems with bleeding um and that would be an exclusion criteria to give an example and another example might be MRI scans. So we use MRI scans to understand how the brain changes as um, we go through the study. And sometimes people can get really claustrophobic with MRI and 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 can't tolerate it. So so that would be an exclusion as well. That's with Generation HD two being a new trial. Then is the inclusion criteria similar to Generation HD one? Or what did you use, go back to the drawing board for that? Or how did you use, come up with your Generation HD to inclusion criteria? So it's a great question. A lot of the um, inclusion criteria is similar. So when we think about, you know, lumbar punctures and MRI, then things around that will be, will be similar. Um, or, you know, medications that people are taking and stuff like that. The the difference is so age and cap is, is part of it, but we're also including um individuals who are prodromal. Prodromal means that um you you don't really have obvious signs of HD. You might have some really subtle signs that only your neurologist can pick up. But so we're including prodromal in this prodromal individuals in this study that weren't included in generation HD1. So they so wouldn't be people. Member, yeah. Sorry. Right. As a community member, would I be right in saying prodromal? Okay. Prodromal is what I would personally say pre symptomatic or early yeah. symptoms. Yeah. So that's yeah. so it would be, I think it wouldn't. So pre symptomatic would be a bigger umbrella of anybody oh. that doesn't have symptoms the the term prodromal is used more in clinical research for the benefit of doctors don't like to give a diagnosis until they're really really sure that the symptoms are having symptoms of disease so there may be you know years of subtle changes yeah but they may not be classed as the old kind of classic this is huntington's disease yeah. so it's that kind of it prodromal is that pre-diagnosis so that, whereas there's people that are pre-manifest that have absolutely no signs of hd and we're, we know that um so that's the slight difference so prodromal is that it's it was made it's created to kind of have it's more useful in the clinic for clinicians than it is for anything that it's it's not that helpful for patients i don't think um and yeah i don't know 
It, 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 yeah, no, I mean, Lauren, you've spent a while. It, it's just if you have very, very subtle symptoms or signs that you may not be aware of yourself, but when your neurologist examines you, they, mm -hmm. they can pick it up because they examine people with HD all the time. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, definitely not pre symptomatic, then that was the wrong term to use. It, no, it's, it's a really of, important question yeah. because it's, it's, it's just what came to my mind. I'm yeah. like, oh, like super, super, super early days. That's what I was no. thinking. I was and like, that's actually really why it's important to clarify because I think, you know, when I think some of the community members hear about younger people or the when you say we're going to have, include younger and people with lower cap that might be something important to discuss and what do you mean by younger um because i i think that's um where the cap score helps yeah. differentiate that so why why is the cap sh score used maybe you could explain a bit peter so the cap score is typically used to ensure that when when you're running a clinical trial you you need to be confident that people will progress during the trial and the reason why you ne you need to have that is that if people don't progress then you'll never know if people didn't progress because of the drug or they were they just didn't progress so the cap score is a way of um being more confident that people will progress over the one year or two year duration of the trial so that you can understand whether the drug works or not So it kind of is a way to create like a, a bottom limit. So you're not selecting people that are too pre-symptomatic, too far from ever having symptoms that you wouldn't ever see signed during the time frame, any the time frame of a trial anyway. Yeah. You you need to be able to measure something that changes over time and in, in, in any trial so that then you can compare treatment and, and people that are protected. Am I allowed to ask what the time frame of HD. Can I shorten it to HD too? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> What's the time frame then? Because that does make really good sense. And I personally never thought about it. Like, you know, if you have, you know, a patient with Huntington's disease and they're in this drug trial and you're giving them this drug, you know, I'm thinking about my dad who had HD and I'm like, we had years where I personally thought he was pretty similar. So if he was in that trial through them years, you'd have been looking at him going, so there's no difference. And that's not what you need. So what what is your time frame for HD2? So HD2, we're looking at a time frame of 16 months. Um, so everyone will have 16 months of, of treatment that or treatment or placebo that, are, that enrolls in the study. We, we have what's called the common close design, and that means that for some participants, they'll be on the trial longer. So it means that if you're the first person on the study, you'll continue past 16 months until the last person has had their last visit. So the last person on the study will have 16 months, but everyone else will keep on going until they're finished. And that's that's called a common close. And Does that does that include people that were on placebo yeah. or so would they go on to the drug after so those two uh, months uh, everyone they just would stay will continue on blinded treatment until the last person has had their last visit mm -hmm. and the, the benefit of this is it gives you longer term data so that if you the, the longer you wait, the, the more changes that you'll see and the more information that you'll have. So by having that longer term in some people, you'll be able to understand, well, was there a small effect at 16 months? Did it get bigger at 18 months and even bigger at 20 months? And then that'll give you some confidence whether the drug's working or not. I guess it helps to compare it to the normal format where um, someone takes part and does the same regime, but when they finish, they're kind of, you know go home we wait yeah. another they might have to wait you know another year before the other people finish and um, then you've lost that opportunity to kind of have extra data i guess and this is one of the other benefits as well about potential benefits i should say that 
because if you stop after the 16 months and you have to wait then for the last person to to finish there there'll be a gap between you having had the last treatment whether it be treatment or placebo but there'll be a gap and then you start and say an open label extension well, i'm sorry i'll come back and explain what an open label extension is <laughs> but, but 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 there'll be a gap between you having the last treatment and then maybe you getting more treatment later on what a common close does is it means that you don't have that gap because you keep going until the last person has completed their last visit so it, it, it's it's helpful that way too is that just a case where you maybe need this many participants to you know sign up for this trial and it's just taking you time to find the right people that fit the criteria that, you know, so you're just giving yourself that time. So it's not as if you're saying on, you know, the 1st of January, we have X amount of people and everybody's going to start at once. You know, it's 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 maybe yeah. a bit more like. like yeah, it's just not even feasible for, for yeah. if you think of the centres that are trying to run this, they can't just recruit everybody at one go because, yeah. you know. Every, um, it, it, yeah, the different centers get activated at different times because it just it, it takes different lengths of times yeah. for things to get up and running in, in different places. So there there's always a a, a time where it, it takes to recruit everyone into the study. Yeah, and yeah. you yeah. mentioned open label extensions. Yes. Uh. <laughs> so maybe I'll just explain what that is. Um. An open label extension is when everyone has the treatment. So typically um, you might run a phase one or a phase two study or even a phase three study. And once um, someone has completed their time and the the big study or the the the, the, the placebo planned, control, the planned, the planned study. study, yeah, yeah. Then, then they'll move into what's called an open label extension where everyone gets treatment. Um and they'll continue on that un un until um you know un until maybe you go for drug approval or something like that. So that would include people that maybe participated in the the main study, the plan study, but didn't get the drug because they were on the placebo group. So it's a way for you know people to participate that could potentially get yeah. drug and after. I suppose in one way it sort of helps like if you're taking part in a study and you don't know whether you're getting the drug or you're getting the placebo, at least you know exactly. at the end of it, if yeah. you were on the placebo, you're going to get it eventually, you know, so in my head, and this is me personally, does it matter what group you're in for during the study? Because at least you're going to get it at the end of it, you know. So it's a really nice mm -hmm. way, I suppose, to help the community sort of feel like, OK, I'm going for it because I don't have that hesitancy that I could be doing this and getting a pin pricked on my back and nothing actually happen. You know, there's nothing there. I, I think it's it's important for me to say for Generation HD2, what we once we finish the the study or the the main study, we'll look at the data, and if we're confident that we have a dose that's safe that lowers Huntington and that shows benefit, then we would like them to move to an open label extension where where everyone can get get drug. But I think we we need to we need to have that confidence first and, and know what dose to go with, and make sure there's no safety things exactly. and everything because you know it's we. Uh it's important that every, every a lot of people want to take part in trials and stuff but we are testing a new yeah. product that you know we don't know what it's going to do to the human body and that's why these these trials are so so important um so where are the trial sites and how are they selected so we i think the first thing to say is that generation hd2 was a really big study so it was what we call a phase three study um We've moved Generation HD2 as a phase two study, so it's a little bit smaller. Um, but we're still an international study, so we have sites in Europe, um, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, America, South America. Um, so we, we, we still have a good coverage, but maybe a little less than we had in Generation HD1. I think in terms of how we select sites, so... We need to, first of all, we need the site to want to, you know, do the study and, and be interested. 
but also we need the site to be able to do the study. So to be able to do lumbar punctures, to be able to do MRI scans um, and, and things like that. And I think once we're confident the site can do that, then we will undergo, you know, talks with them and 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 um, and, and get them on board to, to run the study. Uh, one of the things that we're really lucky in Huntington's disease because we have the Enroll HD um, natural history study, and that's really helpful in helping us understand where are the sites, um, are there people that can be involved at the sites, and and and, and do they have the infrastructure to run things? So so we we use that a lot to um, select sites. No, it, it sounds like a lot goes into, you know, getting a drug trial up and going and there's a lot of complexities with choosing your site and, you know, why that site was chosen or why that certain country. But I'm just wondering, you know, I'm here in Northern Ireland, <laughs> as the other two of you are, and there's not, there's no site in Northern Ireland. You know, what if I, you know had my gene status and wanted to get involved with this trial can i go somewhere that there is a site you know maybe like mainland uk or down to ireland or i'm not asking to go to america like <laughs> but could i go somewhere relatively close to my yeah to so involved? the simple answer is yes um but it it really relies on whether the the doctor at the site that you're interested in doing the study is is, is confident that they can look after you, and um, and and that you'll be safe and things like this, and 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 feels that you know you taking a number of flights every so often is it's not too burdensome for you, and it, it's something that is is reasonable for you to do and you know expect you to do so there's there's no restriction in terms of of um going to say northern ireland to to, to london or, or or something like that i think the other thing to bear in mind is language so there are a number of languages that that we have in the study that you know you can do the assessments in different languages but if if you're not flu if you're not fluent in one of those languages, then that would make it difficult as well. So there's a, there's a couple of things to bear in mind, but there's no there's no restriction on on you going from one country to the next as long as it's feasible, as long as it's safe, and as long as the PI is confident that it's safe. Do you know what? The, as you were given that answer, Peter, the one thing that was screaming in my head was patient care is so important to you know the trial sites to you guys you know it just it was just going in my head that you know because as much as I might really really want to flying over and back to London and things like that could maybe take its toll on me so I really love that patient care is a high priority in you guys you know which is super sweet yeah and it's it's important for us to be, you know, we know how much these drugs are needed and we're all desperate for them. Um, but it also, we, I think it's very important for clinical sites and, and drug companies to be careful about how they, you know, they, they don't want to take advantage of the community either and they want to not sell them. You know, you know, a lot of people want to take part in trials, but um, it, it's important that it's right for that person to take part because it's a big it's a huge undertaking and I'm so grateful for anybody who does take part in trials um they're absolute heroes but um it's a big undertaking I mean safety and, and the welfare for the um for someone who's partaking is our number one priority anything else is is secondary so we you know we have to be comfortable in the doctor doing the trial has to be comfortable that the best interests of of those taking part are, are taken. It does definitely seem like you have such a passion, you know, and like you said, you started working with the HD community and you just can't get away from us now, sure it's great. You know, so the, you know, the passion is there, you know, we all want this to work and, you know, it's, 
it's patient safety and getting across that finish line in the best possible way you know and that's definitely one thing I took away from today's talk you know so thank you you know for being so clear with that because it definitely has made me feel you know a lot more confident in that that it's you know like Lauren said maybe I'm rewording you here but it's not just we need people with fit this criteria and we're just going to do this drug trial on them. It's no, we need to make sure that, you know, they're safe and they're looked after as well. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah. So we're really excited to keep up to date with everything that's going on. Um, where's the best place to hear in the next stages of, or the progress of HD2? So we, we, we um we usually present at the upcoming conferences, so um, CHDI conference in February, and then I think a, a bigger conference is the HDN conference in September. Um, so we usually provide updates um, as much as we can um, at those conferences, but I think that um, once once we get to the end of the study, then we'll be able to um, communicate the results and things like this. We are doing a EHA webinar um, in January as well um, to just uh, communicate and, and, and update everyone in terms of what's going on. Um, and, and we're planning some other webinars in, in January too. So um, keep your eye out for that. The other big news is that we have the manuscript coming out tomorrow. Um, that's exciting. That's the results from Generation HD one. So if well, actually, to... it would be last week. Um, <laughs> it came out last well, week. Well, I've seen it, but you know, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> well, I, it's a great read. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's also other streams of where you can keep up to date, you know, HD or continue committed, continually committed to kind of breaking down some of this. And we'll hopefully be able to do more of these kind of sessions with yourself or anybody of the Roche team. Um, and we also have um, updates on our websites and trying on the website, trying uh, if you go to the research section and trials, um, you'll we try and keep that regularly updated. Um, and yeah, I don't know if we have any final thoughts, Ashley. I'm really amazed at how much I understood. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to say thank you because I'm hoping when I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, sure I'm a whiz on the old Gen 1, HD 1 and 2, you know. I'm hoping everybody else watching this will be thinking the same. So, Peter. I can't thank you enough for explaining it in a way that, you know, the likes of myself, a regular HD community member could actually understand it. So that honestly means the world. So thanks for joining us and oh, so speaking in a way that I could understand. Although I don't think anybody else is going to understand these Northern Ireland accents. <laughs> yeah. sure. Thank God for translation and post, uh, post talk editing. <laughs> Post production, um, it'll be our own post hoc analysis of uh, yeah. this, um, communication. And now I, I know what that means. I, I think we're going to leave it on that note. Um, thank you so much for listening, and please keep up to date with uh, follow us on Instagram and check out the website for further breaking down barrier videos. Thank you so much, Peter, and my my Thanks. partner in crime, Ashley. Um. We will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.